Okay, good morning to everybody. Welcome to the symposium. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank to Gentium, to my co uh, chairman, Dr. Professor of Digital and Research, and myself, to all you for being here for us and to assist to this interesting symposium on prevention and management of the VOD and GBHD. The, the, as I mentioned you, uh, Professor Dietgen and me we will be the chair of these sessions and the speakers that we have planned for these sessions are myself, the first speaker, talking about the physiology and incidence of venoclusive disease and uh, what we have learned in the last three years. The second talk has been a little bit changed because Professor Paul Richardson could not assist and his talk will be given by Professor Dietgen Niederwieser. Uh, about therapy of established BOD. The first talk is on acute GVHD, what are the causes and consequences of a cellular level, made by Professor Hall from the Hesburgh University. And the last one would be the presentation by Professor Selim Skobelchelchuk from also University of Regensburg about prevention on VOD and GVHD, what did we learn from VOD difficult type prevention trial. Uh, two additional things, please remember to shoot off your telephone, mobile telephones, because if not, it's a problem for the speakers or for the audience. And a second one, I will remember that several times along the session. Remember, it's important for all of us and for you to fill in these questionnaires uh, uh, and uh, return us when we finish the meeting. Now. I will introduce you myself, perhaps it's the same, the, the best, if you want to introduce me, Dicker. No, I introduce myself, okay. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker of this symposium, is the Dr. Carreras from the University of Barcelona, and my talk will still focus it on what we have learned in the last 30 years about the physiology, incidence, and outcome of genocrosis disease. <coughs> works or it not works this this screen is a little bit strange sorry if there is problems since the first description of VOD after a stem cell transplant in 1979 we have learned that the uh, this complication consists in a concentric non-thrombotic narrowing of the lumen of the small intrahepatic veins this is the cause of the obstruction of the sinusoidal flow that produced main clinical manifestation to the disease. More recently, thanks to experimental models, we have learned that this complication, the first morphological change observed in this complication, occurs in the sinusoidal endothelial seals. We think doesn't work. We think that what happen is the endothelial along the transplant suffers several processes that several injuries caused by the conditioning regimen, the interleukin uh, uh, it doesn't work well. The interleukin produced by this conditioning and the tissue damage by the alloreactivity, by the production of neutrophils during the engravement, by the use of calcineurin inhibitors and by many other agents present in the serum of this patient. All these agents produce a endothelial activation. This is a physiological event that consists mainly in a procoagulant status, a change uh, in, in inflammatory response, in increasing the permeability and a vasoconstriction. This is a change to the phenotype of the endothelium physiological. But if the stimulus is too high or too prolonged, it occurs that this endothelial uh, activation becomes an endothelial dysfunction. And this mainly consists in the aggregates of fibrin, of fibrin platelets and leukocyte adhesion to endothelium, and even endothelial apoptosis. That could produce an organ damage in different parts of our body. If this part affected is the liver, we will have a venoclusive disease. But if it occurs in other parts, we can have other related diseases that we can observe early after transplant that all of them seems to have the same endothelial origin. In this cartoon, originally it was a video, but this video, it doesn't work in this system. Then I have converted it in, four, in five cartoons. In this cartoon, you can see the sinusoidal flow. You can see the endothelial cells here. You can see the hepatocytes. And you can see here the space of dice. 
when uh, it seems that it occurs in verocrusive disease is as, as follows. First of all, this uh, not well-known stimulus that we have mentioned pro uh, produce a ballooning, a ballooning of the endothelial cells. This ballooning opens the, 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 the junction between cells, the grape between cells, and this permits the pass of red blood cells to the space of this. These cells in the space of this progressively detach the endothelial leaning from the, uh, uh, the space of this and progressively occlude the lumen of the sinusoid, arriving to a final flow obstruction and the production of post-sinusoidal hypertension that is the cause of the clinical manifestations of this complication. One of the most well-known pathogens producing DOD are the condition regimen. Especially, we know that busulfan and cyclophosphamide has been reported as the main cause of this complication. And this occurs because cyclophosphamide is completely metabolized in the liver. Cyclophosphamide is metabolized by the P4515 enzymatic system that produces a toxic metabolite called acroin. This toxic metabolite usually is again metabolized by the glutathione enzymatic system that produces non-toxic metabolites that could be excreted by the bile. However, if this patient before cyclophosphamide receive drugs last, like busulfan, PBI, BCNU, etoposide, that produce a reduction in the concentration of the glutathione enzymatic system, this metabolization of the toxic metabolites is blocked. And when it's blocked, it produces the endothelial damage. We have also learned that it happens mainly around the central veins due to the special metabolism of the liver. It's not all the liver affected by the venoclusive disease, it's around the veins. And this is due to the special metabolism of the liver. Remember that the liver has different zones with different enzymatic patterns. If you remember, the zone 3 is the zone that surrounds completely the central vein, is a zone very rich in P415 a system and very poor in glutathione. It means that the, there is a lot of toxic metabolites light there that could not be metabolized because there is not enough uh, enzymatic glutathione. To analyze all these aspects and to deep more on this knowledge, we decided in conjunction or with the help of Dr. Holler from the Regensburg University to perform studies in our patients. We collect sample, samples from uh, patients receiving autologous transplant with two different conditioning regimen, and from allogenic transplant, with patients receiving a MAC uh, transplant, another receiving a RIC transplant, and we collect these samples always through a central venous catheter before the conditioning, on day zero before the stem cells infusion, on day 7, 14, and 21. We perform several ex vivo studies analyzing the, sol the soluble markers of endothelial damage, like von Willebrand, ADAMS 13, several adhesion molecules, TNF, alpha receptor 1, etc. And we observe always the same pattern. The pattern is that we observe that both in ALO and auto and in ALO, it exists a progressive endothelial damage along the transplant, that it reaches its maximum after autologous transplant on the 14. And this stimulus progress up to day 21 in the allogenic transplant. We also observe that this uh, aggression, this, this, uh, this uh, activation is higher among those receiving a myeloblative transplant than among those receiving a, re a RIP transplant. This, this profile is observed in all experiments that we perform. Here you have at the, at the, at the left the VCAM and to the right the TNF receptor 1 exactly with the same pattern. When we compare patients with this uh, venoclusive disease and without venoclusive disease with one of the markers, we have several other, but here I'm showing you the von Willebrand factor, we can observe that it's a clearly higher levels of this marker, but unfortunately we have so many, so few cases of venoclusive disease that these differences do not reach statistical significance. But it's very clear that it's a higher uh, levels of von Willebrand. 
We also perform several in, vit in vitro studies using macrovascular and microvascular endothelial cells that were cultured with a pool of patient serum. After this culture, we separate the, monolos, the endothelial cells monolayer and the extracellular matrix, and there we perform immunochemistry studies, basically uh, adhesion receptors. Also, we analyze the adhesion proteins to the extracellular matrix. We perform perfusion studies, analyzing the uh, adhesion of leukocytes over the extracellular matrix and the endothelial cells, and the adhesion of platelets over the uh, end of the extracellular matrix. And finally, we choose several transduction signals in order to evaluate inflammation, apoptosis, and proliferation P38 MAP kinase, SAP junk, and ERD4244. In all the studies, we observed similar results. In autologous, exactly the same profile than we observed in the previous studies. In the allogeneic, it was a little bit changed because the profile has a two peaks instead of B progressive. You have a peak on day zero and a peak on day 21. This correlates perfectly when we compare with the MAP kinase, P38 MAP kinase. We can see the peak on day 14 and two peaks on day zero and 21. All the other studies may perform on inflammation. Uh, here you can see the leukocyte adhesion to extracellular cells follows exactly the same pattern that I have shown you before. The same occurred when you study the thrombogenicity of the extracellular matrix by means of the platelet adhesion. You can see that the pattern is the same despite in autologous the uh, increase is lower than in allogeneic. Here, another example, bone milligram factor concentration in the extracellular matrix, you can see it follows exactly the same pattern. We observe also in the cultures, that is very clear when you look at the cultures, that it exists proliferation, and that this proliferation, when is measured by R4244, it occurs again on day 14, 0, and 21. The only thing different was when we analyze apoptosis, that it was also very evident in the cultures. When we analyze apoptosis, we only observe changes in subjunct in allogeneic settings. There is not apoptosis among uh, autologous transplant. Right? In summary of this new knowledge, we can say that we know that both autologous and allogeneic transplant have a pro inflammatory phenotype that the prothrombotic phenotype is mainly occurring in allogeneic transplant, both have proliferation, and only apoptosis is absorbed only in allogeneic transplant. Here we can speculate, could be this the reason why we observe this phenomenon, thrombotic phenomenon of inoclusive disease and thrombotic myocardiology only in the allogeneic setting and not among autologous transplant, is a possibility. Okay, we move. Incidents. Let me drink a little water. I had the opportunity and the pleasure to collaborate with this study recently published analyzing a long series of patients, almost 25,000, with more than 3,000 uh, cases of venoclusive disease. And this study, we observed several things. One is the incidence of venoclusive disease, the median incidence was 40%, that the incidence was higher among those using Seattle criteria than those using Baltimore that the incidence is higher in the allogeneic than autologous, but also that the incidence it was higher after 1994. And this is was very strange for us because it's not the feeling of, of our institution. We are convinced that the, the incidence of UXZ was decreasing. For that reason, we performed this study. We analyzed 845 consecutive allogeneic, only allogeneic patients transplant in our center, and the relevance of our series is that is a series treated very homogeneously. All of them have the same type of conditioning and prophylaxis of GVD, that all cases, without any case, have received prophylaxis for, for, uh, for venoclusive disease, except those receiving a seven transplant with a previous liver disease who received low molecular weight that all patients have evaluated by a team of physicians and nurses focused on the study of venoclusive disease since 1984, and finally, that we use exactly the same guidelines for diagnosis and management of all cases of BOD. Here is the series. You can see that there are 763 patients. It means that 50% of them receive a second transplant. 
the half of them received the trust map before 1997, and the other half after this data. 50% of them were acute leukemias or myelodysplasia, 82% were MAC transplant, and 18, uh, eight, uh, 81, uh, 18 uh, rig transplant. 20% were on related transplant, most of the numbers say bone marrow, 62% and 42% peripheral blood. Look, this is the incidence, the cumulative incidence of venoclusive disease. In the column, in the central column, we can uh, observe the data using the Seattle criteria. In the right, using the Baltimore criteria, in order if you want to use one or another. The cumulative incidence was 14% for Seattle, 12% for Baltimore. It's, it's uh, notable that 22% uh, of patients uh, in the Seattle and 48% have a severe VOD, severe VD using the classical uh, Seattle criteria for this diagnosis. If you use the more recent um, criteria of severe VOD, it means severe plus uh, uh, multi-organ damage, the incidence was 22% and 36% respectively. Then we start to compare. We compare patients only using those with a BOD using the Baltimore criteria. In this little cartoon, you can see myelolative transplants, MAC transplants, comparing before and after 1997. We can see that the incidence of BOD has reduced a little bit, but not, is not significant. That the incidence among those receiving an HLA identical sibling transplant is exactly the same, but we have a clear reduction of uh, incidence of BOD when the transplant analyzes only the unrelated transplant from 32% to 11%. It means that, uh, sorry, clearly we have a loss reduction of uh, VOD among MAC receiving on unrelated transplant. This could be caused by an improvement management in the unrelated transplant due to a better selection of patients because we use uh, a more strict HLA criteria now? Probably. When we compare after 1997 patients receiving a RIC transplant versus a MAC transplant, we can observe a clear reduction in the incidence of VOD, 2% against 8%. This incidence was clearly, clearly evident in HLA identical civil. No cases of BOD among rig transplant in HLA identical civil. But curiously, the incidence among those receiving an unrelated transplant is exactly the same. Then it's an interesting thing, but it, in, it shows us show that the incidence of VOD is not reduced using the RIC in unrelated transplant. It means that the, perhaps the allo reactivity that we know that contribute to VOD counterbalances the beneficial effect of RIC. We don't know, but it's a possibility. When we analyze the risk factors, we only observe as a new factor respecting previous series the fact of use a RIC transplant. And finally, two slides to talk about the evolution. The evolution was as follows. I mentioned you that we have 22% and 36% of patients with a severe VOD, and the cumulative incidence of mortality rate by VOD in this series was 17% among Seattle criteria, 27% among Baltimore criteria. But the most relevant thing is when we compare before and after year 1997, we pass from 22% to 9% and 36% to 14%. The only change introduced in our institution during these years in the management of VOD is that the year 2000, all, those page, all patients that fulfill the Baltimore criteria recited the fibrotide in compassionate use. And we compare these patients, look, these are the cartoon with the 26 patients with multi-organ failure. You can see that only two of the eight patients receiving the fibrotide died of VOD, compared with 14 of 18 that, receive, that do not receive the fibrotide, 78% with a clear statistical significance in the evolution of this patient. This is not a strange for us, because our previous studies have shown that when we put in the media of the culture the fibrotide, we reach that the expression of the receptors disappear. And we put the fibrotide in the media, we, re we reach that it disappears, 
the adhesion of the platelets to the, the extracellular matrix, and we reach that it disappeared the expression of tissue factor here on bone villar here in the extracellular matrix, and you can see in this slide. Then, for us, it was not a strange this observation. In conclusion, over these last 30 years, we have learned one, we have improved our knowledge on pathogenesis. Now we clearly know that is a consequence of the sinusoidal damage. We need to dip in more uh, uh, molecular events, but we are working on that. That the incidence of VOD has decreased, but not only as a consequence of the rich transplants, we have probably uh, doing better transplant, better selection of patients, better selection of donors, and probably also better management. We can see that the risk factors of VD has not changed except for the, uh, the, the development of the risk transplants. And we can say that the prognosis of BDD has improved due to a better management and also to the accessibility to the field. And that's all. Uh, thank you to all of you for your attention and especially for all these people from my hospital, from the, the clinical uh, department, for the lab department, and also for all our colleagues from the Regensburg University that collaborate very much for, with all these studies. Thank you very much for your attention. I pass as a chair. I questions in the room? If not, there is possible. There is a question. Uh, I didn't know from Turkey. Uh, the OED incidence less than five in my country. And I try to ask about the incidence of the VOD. It uh, maybe depend on geographically or some uh, genetically may be different from the country, from another country? Look, uh, the, the inc an incidence of 5%, if you consider all VOD, autologous and allogenic, is normal, is, uh, is, uh, is similar to the result of the BBMT uh, study. But it's true that it exists among the risk factors. One risk factor that is not very well known is the, um, the, the different pro genetic profiles respecting the, the metabolization of the drugs in the liver. Uh, and there, there are several um, market, no markers, I, I, I don't know, polymor exactly. There are several polymorphisms that uh, favor the development of venocosy disease. And there are two publications on that made in India that perhaps you can have several similar patterns in your country, showing that they have a lower incidence of VOD in some groups and a higher incidence in other groups. Then it's possible and is well known that the polymorphisms could have an impact on the risk of VOD. It's very clear. There might be also the history of hepatitis, which is important. This is another thing, yes. It's true. This is a relevant thing because in some countries the incidence of hepatitis is very high, but the, the, the incidence is very low. Then it should be the Poseidon. No? Yeah. 